Welcome, good afternoon. On behalf of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, I welcome all those who have registered and are attending this presentation. Um, Loic, I'm gonna let you know that I am not able to advance the PowerPoint for some reason. Um, have you given me control? Despite all our technical checks, uh, we still are having a technical issue. Uh, I thought we had solved this problem, but okay, there we go. On behalf of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, we, we welcome you to this webinar, which is entitled Representation Opportunities for Attorneys in Esports Post-COVID-19. We appreciate your taking the time to attend and we want to thank the diversity committee of the new york state bars entertainment arts and sports law section who is co-sponsoring this webinar with us i would like now to introduce the panel to you we have with us hal viegas he is the founding executive director of NALCS Players Association. This is a trade association representing the interests and well being of over 100 professional players of the Riot Esports game League of Legends. He is a graduate of Boston University and UCLA Law School. And among his many accomplishments and prior positions in the world of sports, he has served as Assistant General Counsel of the National Basketball Players Association, Executive Vice President of Team Sports for Wasserman Media Group, uh, covering sports of NBA, WNBA, NFL, MLB, MLS, and Olympic sports. He has been executive vice president, I'm sorry, senior vice president of Excel Sports Management, representing over 35 coaches, broadcasters, and executives in the NBA and NCAA, covering basketball, baseball, volleyball, and soccer. We have next Tara in Nahoro. Tara is a, I'm sorry, Tara is Chief Executive Officer at Unanimous Games, which is a full service esports company. She got her undergraduate degree from St. John's University and her law degree, JD, from the University of Birmingham in England with a distinction in commercial uh, practice and she received an international law LLM. She has been an attorney in labor and employment uh, with Madhu Gubono Cooper <laughs> LLP, an oil and gas company, and I am sorry for murdering that name. She has been an attorney with Movido Exploration and Production Limited. She has practiced e-discovery with the New York City Law Department and has practiced family law with the Bronx County family court. Roger Quiles is one of the world's first esports attorneys, beginning his practice in 2015. He is the founding partner of the law firm Quiles Law, which exclusively services the esports industry. He is a graduate of Fordham undergrad and Cardozo School of Law. He has an international clientele through North America, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. He practiced, his practice is both uh, dis disciplinary and international, advising on business issues, entertainment, intellectual property, corporate M&A, and iGaming matters. And I will be serving as 
your moderator today. My name is Jill Pilgrim. I practice here in New York City. Before we get into the program, I want to let you know that you should have received the program outline with attachments and the full bios of all the panel and the moderator are in those materials, as well as the outline of the issues and discussions that we are going to have today. So we want to start with the obvious question that some of you may still be unclear about, which is, what is esports? So Roger, why don't you take us into that issue a little bit and explain to the participants who may be like me, not an esporter or a gamer, and I'm still confused. What is esports? Sure. So esports is the professional play of video games for money. I think that's probably the simplest definition that that you can give there. Um, that's that's you know varies in terms of whether it's tournament structure or league structured, uh, but that's the, the that's the nuts and bolts. And Hal, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, sure. I, I mean, I, I think Roger covered the uh, the essence of it. Um, in addition to tournament versus league structure, there are a couple of different uh, formats of, of um, eSport, um, primarily first-person shooter, which is referred to as FPS, and uh, multiplayer online battle arena, which is uh, commonly known as MOBA. Um, they each have their um, their adherents and um, you know, their leagues, uh, professional leagues structured around both of the formats. Um, some of the more popular FPS games would be Halo, Call of Duty, Overwatch and Doom, uh, also uh, Counter-Strike, uh, and then some of the more popular MOBA games would be League of Legends, which is the league I'm associated with, uh, Dota, um, StarCraft, Warcraft, and, and Smite. Um, the couple of key differences, um, just a um, first-person shooter is typically um, a, a format where it, the, the, the person playing the game is, is in the eyes of the shooter, it's the first person whereas uh, multiplayer online battle arena is typically a third person perspective for the player. Um, both formats uh, can either be solo or, or group play. Um, they all involve strategy and, uh, and tactics. And um, uh, as I said, both have leagues and both are also um, very popular uh, with amateur play. Um, one, other, uh, one other sort of component of esports is that um, most of the leagues, everything that's done professionally is structured around um, PC play, but um, on the amateur scene, um, it's uh, you can play either on PC or on, on console games like Xbox or PlayStation. And do you want to explain the league versus tournaments or, or will that be Roger? Uh, either Roger, you want to go for sure. it or you want me to? Uh, so the the important thing to recognize with when it comes to esports is that fundamentally um these are the, this is intellectual property um a video game unto itself is very different than a sport because it's, you know no one owns basketball however riot games owns league of legends um so what happens is the developers of these games because they own the ip then have the ability to structure out what they want their esports uh, structure to look like basically through its licensing system. So for instance, and you have a wide array uh, in terms of um, how the developers uh, do license their and license and structure their esports systems. So just to paint a, a very easy comparison, you have uh, Riot Games, which owns the IP of League of Legends. They run a very closed community um, in terms of they don't really license out their IP. They handle everything in-house in terms of league structure, development, and so on, uh, and contrast that with Valve, who is the developer of Counter-Strike, and, Counter and Valve takes a very hands-off approach, and they say, well, you know, if you want to run a, a Counter-Strike tournament, you know, go ahead. You know, you can license that out and let the various third-party tournament organizers uh, structure their events as they see fit. Uh, and then there's everything in between, right? There, there's a little, there's some structures that, you know, will 
withhold any licenses above a certain threshold in terms of prize money. Um, and there's others that are a little more uh, close to that line of, of being a little freer with the IP in terms of the structure. Okay, that's great. Uh, Tara, just want to let you know, we can't see you on screen. So uh, hopefully we'll get you back shortly. And Hal, talk to the audience about the comparison to of e esports to traditional sports, because you've had a long history in traditional sports. Certainly. Uh, well, I think Roger covered the key difference, um, which is just the, the fact that um, the game developers, the um, own the games they own the ip and without them there you know there is no professional league um so it everything is done through their consent and um they maintain a, a varying degrees of oversight with regard to the leagues that, that are established um we've recently seen them um esport leagues to follow the the traditional sport model of franchising both overwatch and league of legends in the last couple of years have gone to franchising whereas before uh, they operated on a different system where the teams were just sort of in the league and um, uh, there was relegation, uh, much like you have in European football. Um, but uh, franchising seems to be the trend that everybody is moving toward. Uh, one other key difference, uh, just to point out here, would be the way that uh, the, the fans, the consumers, um, receive, the, receive the content. Uh, in esports, it's almost all done via streaming. So Twitch, YouTube, other streaming outlets are the primary way that uh, that the fan bases watch the content. Um, you know, and, and and you know, streaming is a one of the things that makes streaming so great, particularly from a fan perspective, is the ability to um, hear what's going on, to um, you know, uh, to follow what the what the players are doing as they're doing it. Um, you know, you hear the, uh, the the you can hear the conversations between the teams. Um, you, um, when there's, there are different kinds of streaming, there's, there's gameplay streaming, but there's also streaming that happens where players are just practicing or they're doing solo queue where they're streaming the game for fun. And in those instances, there's both chat and communication functions between the fans and the, and the, and the athletes. So it'd be akin to, you know, having LeBron James, not just mic'd up doing a game, but able to, you know, hear and receive questions from from fans or engage with fans as he's as he's running through a play, um, or Tom Brady, uh, you know, doing the same thing with a with a football fan, just being able to, say, you know, as he walked to the line of scrimmage, saying, okay, you know, on this play, uh, I'm going to have um, Gronk do a 10 yard button hook, and um, uh, you know, and the offensive line is going to pull to the left, so the defense shifts right. And, you know, it's just it's really it's a different level of engagement that doesn't exist in traditional sports and is one of the key differentiators. Um, and uh, I, I think traditional sports is going to move towards streaming. Um, but for right now, that's a, that's a big distinction. My apologies for the sirens in the background. We are in the time <laughs> that we're in. So Roger and Tara, talk to us about esports players versus gamers. And, and do we have Tara back? I'm here. It's just I'm having trouble with my webcam. So I'm still, you could hear me, you just can't see me. Sorry. Okay. So do you want to start the discussion about the distinction between esport players and esport gamers? Um, you mean like professionals play, professional players and amateur players? Because that's really where the distinction is. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, like they touched on before, professional players are pretty much are players that are assigned to teams, leagues, and are sponsored by organizations that re, um, receive a salary. Their organizations pay for them to go to tournaments, um, receive housing, certain benefits, and pretty much it's an actual job for them. So that's what a professional player is. So for instance, you have like the 2K league where as soon as you're assigned to the team, it's essentially kind of like being signed to a regular NBA team, you, well, probably not exactly, because they pay, for, what it is that you, um, you pay for your salary, you get um, benefits, they pay for your housing, and as well as practicing and training and things like that. So that's what a professional player is. And then an amateur player are pretty much casual players, to be quite honest. I mean, so there are players that they can um, enter tournaments, you're not necessarily sponsored by an organization, you are essentially paying for yourself to get back and forth to tournaments you're building your own brand you're not really associated with any organization that's really the big uh, difference 
Okay, Roger, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I think that's that's certainly the 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 basics involved. And I think um, the the one point to add there is, you know, realistically, at some point or another, every professional player was an amateur player, uh, mm -hmm. and the difference in terms of of you know how does one hit that next level of becoming a pro really comes down to um, their own development and their own notoriety within the space, uh, which you tend to see happening through online tournaments. Um, most, not all games have uh, in-person events, some do, but oftentimes that can be very cost prohibitive for a young player who's trying to all of a sudden go pro that doesn't have you know, the financial backing to be able to travel to go to events. So they participate in all sorts of online tournaments. Um, as Hal spoke to previously, you know, there, this is a very interconnected community uh, between the, the players and the fans. And oftentimes you also see that between your professional players as well as the amateur players. And um, in terms of leaning on them, whether it be for advice, even befriending them or being able to uh, participate in games with them, uh, even times on stream, um, that tends to serve as a platform for an amateur player to start taking all of these baby steps forward that if their skill, time and dedication so allows that they could potentially become a pro player. Now, um, professional players and amateur players aside, there is uh, a separate subset of gamers and I guess esports enthusiasts that you would consider streamers and content creators. And those are more akin to entertainers than the pro athletes. You know, they're engaging on stream with uh, with their fans, generally through a chat, as Hal described previously. Um, and their goal isn't necessarily to be the best player out there. You know, they're there to have fun. They're there to be engaging, to interact. Um, Oftentimes they'll do all sorts of, you know, ridiculous challenges, you know, whatever the flavor of the week challenge is, um, oh. as a means of driving engagement and creating a community around themselves and their brand. So if um, in a traditional sports sense, uh, you could think of streamers and content creators like the dude perfects of the world, you know, your YouTube oh. content. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. your YouTube content creators around sports are not too dissimilar from your content creators or even your streamers on the esports side. One other thing, just uh, one other distinction on the professional versus amateur, uh, just, uh, I mean, obviously professionals get paid, and uh, Tara spoke to this briefly, but, uh, you know, just for the audience, the, you know, salaries in, in the various leagues can range, and the uh, NBA 2K League, the average salary is about $30,000. Um, and in League of Legends, the average salary is well over $300,000, and there are many, many players who make an excess of, of um, you know, high six figures, seven, you know, one million, million and a half dollars um, playing professionally. Um, compare that to streamers and casters, the most successful streamers and casters can make, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 million dollars annually. So, um, you know, there's a lot of differentiation within the space as to what people can make, but uh, we've seen salaries generally across the board in all the leagues and all in the tournaments and what's available to streamers and casters continue to increase fairly uh, exponentially. So let's clarify for the attendees here and for me who is very unfamiliar with all of this, how did these quote unquote leagues develop and what's the difference between a league and associations and then I've heard talk about esports possibly joining the Olympics or not joining the Olympics. So how can you start to help sort that out? Sure. So um, sorry, the first question was how did the leagues develop? Right, right. Okay. So the leagues basically develop primarily as marketing tools for the for the games. So you know, a company like Blizzard, which uh, is responsible for Overwatch and and before that StarCraft and Warcraft, a uh, company like Riot, um, which developed League of Legends. Um, you know, these are extremely popular games in the amateur community. Um, you know, literally millions of people playing them on a on a daily basis. Um, the the leagues developed as an offshoot uh, as a way for them to increase exposure um, to create another vehicle for for fans to to follow the game and and become 
um, adherence to uh, uh, to the leagues. Um, and you know, I think generally they're a relatively small revenue source for uh, for the game developers. Um, you know, the developers make like League of Legends makes you know a, probably a couple billion dollars a year just from gameplay. Um, you know, the league, uh, while successful and, and profitable, is a very small fraction of their overall revenue stream. Uh, but they become more and more popular. We've seen prices for franchises increase from uh, League of Legends when they went franchise, um, when they first went franchise four years ago, three years ago, franchises sold for $10 million. The most recent three or four franchises that have changed hands have sold for north uh, for an excess of $30 million. Um, so, you know, the, the growth in the value of franchises is pretty significant. Overwatch League um, franchises are selling for north of $40 million. Um, so uh, the um, uh, you know they they're becoming more and more profitable components of the of the developers uh, economic pie, but um, you know initially they were just uh, um, marketing tools to help grow and expand the uh, um, the game and the fan base. So as you have all these leagues with games and players, uh, gamers playing all these games. And then you have the professional component, some of the amateurs going over to the professional player side. It's inevitable, right, that there would need to be players associations, right? Talk I'd like to think more. so, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that um, it, it's a little bit of an interesting uh, situation because the developers, um, there's a wide range. There's some developers who are, are very player friendly and there are others who are less so. Um, you know, Riot was one who was very player friendly. Player friendly. Riot was actually um, the impetus behind the, the formation of the Players Association. They went to their players, said that in advance of franchising, they thought it would be beneficial for them to have a unified voice and um, you know executive leadership to um, to be their advocate uh, in various ways. And um, and the players thought that made sense. And and Riot helped with their process and and eventually selecting me as the executive director of the Players Association. Other game developers have been much less um, um, welcoming of, of player um, player unity and, and, and player solidarity. Um, but uh, I think ultimately, you know, that's the direction that we'll head in. You know, there are, you know, players are oftentimes being taken advantage of by these organizations. Um, you know, they, they work for uh, not in many of the leagues, not a lot of money, and they have really arduous schedules. You know, their days are often 14, 16 hours a day of gameplay, strategizing, meetings, uh, working out, um, and um, and then they on top of that, on top of their team obligations, they oftentimes have streaming obligations after their gameplay is over, after their teamwork is done, where they, you know, the 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 organizations, a lot of their revenue comes in via sponsorship, and the sponsorship revenue stream is through streaming. So the players have to go and do streaming, um, which we talked about earlier, uh, where they're engaging with the fans um, in addition to their their team related work. So, you know, they have really long and, and um, brutal days. Um, they, you know, the seasons are very long. There's not a lot of time off. And, um, you know, there are just a lot, a lot of the issues that you see in traditional sports um, particularly, you know, if you went back 30, 40, 50 years, you're starting to see in, in esports. And I think all those things will lead to uh, more and more players associations coming about. I think we've been a good model for uh, for the uh, for the space. And um, I've had conversations with lots of other people about, um, you know, the, the need for players associations. And as I said, I think we'll see more and more of that happening to balance the the leagues and the orgs. It's a look, you know, the model's interesting because You've got unlike traditional sports where you know the NFL really is is an arm of the ownership group, or the NBA is an arm of, of the uh, NBA owners. In in the in the gaming space, as Roger pointed out, the developers are the ones that own the IP. So it's it's still a tri-party system, but the developer has effectively all the power, um, whatever they want to hold on to when they begin their franchising models. So the 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 orgs are. are like NFL or NBA or MLB teams, but with less power. Um, so there's, there's a little more of a balance there. To, yeah. to piggyback on that as well. I'm sorry, Jill. The, yeah, um, yeah. with, with respect to the, the fact that the developers have so much of that power, 
um, that's really been one of the stumbling blocks in terms of a lot of other player collectivization movements of really getting off the ground. Because the developer maintains the IP, they effectively can turn off the switch, you know, close the faucet of access of an, any individual player to their game. Right now, you know, more often than not, in most games, we see the developer as judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to all forms of player discipline. Well, realistically then, when you have the IP, when you can structure the league, when you can then deny access to your IP by denying a license, well then, the players sometimes and oftentimes will essentially fall in line. Um, it's just for fear of, of not being able to participate and engage in their livelihood, which is being a professional player. So there is, you know, a certain extent of, you know, this, I have a good thing going. I don't want to ruin it right now for a lot of esports players, uh, particularly in games with developers that are not very player friendly. But I'm sure over time, you know, there will be those watershed moments, um, you know, sooner or later, we're bound to have whatever the esports equivalent is of uh the kurt flood lawsuit yeah exactly. so, and like, one other uh, you, can you Jill, if i may oh sorry i just, I can't I just wanted to I just, no, i'm sorry go ahead okay. i just wanted to piggyback on one thing one yeah. thing roger said um one other interesting component of all this you know, is that these leagues are often international so mm -hmm. uh like league of legends has multiple leagues there's a north american league there's a european league there's a korea league there's a china league and, and another nine or ten leagues around the world overwatch um is uh has franchises with that play e against each other in china and korea in the us and europe so you know that's another stumbling block or impediment to to organizing um you know you're you're confronting not just U.S. rules, but uh, you know you have to deal with the rules of of various countries and some countries which you know like China that don't even allow unions. So you know there are some additional impediments that you know will have to be dealt with in, in time. But I think as Roger said, one of the keys is just you know there there are going to be these seminal moments that happen, these inflection points where um, you know the players feel that they have to rise up. Um, and have their voice heard as one because individually they're going to continue to get um, worked over by orgs and or developers. That's a nice segue into Roger talking briefly about the whether or not esports should or should not uh, be in the Olympic Games and whether they're being courted for them or not. Sure. So, you know, certainly there's been a lot of talk about the addition of esports or various esports titles into the Olympic Games. Uh, there have been uh, some smaller movements of um, having esports events as meddling events at more regional events like Asian Games and so on. Um, yet, you know, the esports unto itself is something that hasn't really sought the, the, I guess, the embrace really of the IOC. It's, it's really the other way around where you know the olympics are looking at esports as as being this you know injection of youth uh and young blood and young viewership into their programming you know esports is already operating internationally without that um so it's certainly something that uh the international committees is seeking to put forward um yet it is being met with some hesitation on the esports side now that said that hasn't stopped uh, national and even multinational uh, federations from trying to form and coalesce to be these essentially de facto uh, esports Olympic bodies when and if uh, esports does become an Olympic event. Um, thus far, there hasn't really been any sort of significant traction on those on the on the end of the federations. Um, it's basically just been you know other supposed federations joining larger federations yet really no sort of uh no sort of movement there um or no sort of progress really um how can you talk briefly about esports in college and high school is that happening yeah absolutely uh there's a growing body of of participation both at the college and the, and the high school level of esport teams um you know as roger spoke earlier you know, one of the issues with this is the licensing rights. So the developers have to be on board with um, with these leagues happening. But 
uh, you know, we've seen we've seen generally a, a fair level of participation. The developers mostly want their their games out there at, at the um, at the high school and college level. Uh, it helps expand the base of of, uh, of fans. Um, so I, at this point, there are well over 250 colleges that have um, esports teams. Um, and th you know, one of the other things that we haven't really talked about, we use esports as a very broad categori categorization. Um, you know, each game is sort of a, it's in, an entity into itself. So, you know, an eSport team at a college or high school may, may have five or six different games that different kids play. So it's sort of like, you know, akin to having a, a baseball, football, hockey, um, basketball team. So, you know, there may be a League of Legends team, there may be an Overwatch team, there may be, may be a Call of Duty team, um, but uh, at, at some level, um, there couple of hundred colleges and um, an ever-growing number of high school federations that are fielding esport teams for uh, for their students. So we've been alluding throughout uh, and even touching on the fact that esports is big business, right? This is all about business. So on some of these slides, what I've done is just taken titles, headlines from articles that have appeared over the last several years about esports. MasterCard signs a game-changing deal with Riot. Champion signs a peril deal with esports organization. Football, read soccer, esports broadcast coming to life through FIFA. Paris Saint Germain, famous uh, soccer club in, in Paris, uh, partners with Team Flash. So obviously, there is a huge, as has been mentioned, business side that goes along with the playing and professionalism and the leagues and the associations. So, Tara, you're very deep in this as COO of Unanimous. Uh, so let's talk about some of these elements of the business side, about the creative content, for instance. Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the esports community is different from other like forms of entertainment, where how the fans communicate, how the fans are engaged, are through streaming and things like that, which is ways of are different forms of content. So that there's that one that in one instance and then like what roger was saying before even the amateurs where they can't necessarily be signed to a team or signed or get get a sponsor they build their own content through youtube through twitch through facebook through instagram to be quite honest and do different silly videos a lot of things around the lifestyle of gaming and that's how they get a lot of their um branding a lot of their a lot of profits for them so and also, so what you just named as well are a whole bunch of companies that are companies now are trying to find ways to actually touch into gaming. And though tournaments are a huge thing, partners that are not used to being in this traditional space, a way for them to get in is through content creation. So they usually partner with a gamer, they partner with um, a team or a league and just create content which would kind of, in a way, be like a traditional commercial or like a review or something like have their merch or something in the video or do something with it to kind of bring the esports audience to their brand through also building content who owns the content tara mm -hmm. so it depends because if you do it um if you're doing it on a platform the platform essentially would be owning the the content so a lot of the times it, it depends where you, where you where you put it on so for instance if you're streaming something on twitch it's on Twitch. So it's like, you're, and it's based off of viewers. So it all depends how you put the content out, to be quite honest. If it's on your page, it's different. But if you're using it through a certain platform, it's of, of course in partnership with that platform and you have an agreement of how things are split through when you do things to that platform. So talk to us about the console versus, versus mobile um, game. Is, is there, what's important about that distinction? So oh, just like Ha mentioned earlier that you have there are a lot of professional gamers play PC and a lot of amateur gamers play on console. What we don't touch into a lot is on is mobile gaming. So there's a lot of games that are online that are really huge and really popular, like PUBG, Clash Royale, and Fortnite, where you can access them and play them through mobile devices. And even though traditionally like what you see are PC players and console players actually online mobile gaming 
makes up 51% of the esports industry. And so last year, globally, gaming made 156, 156 billion, and about 51% of that came from online from mobile gaming. So I keep on because it's it is online, but you can access it through mobile devices. And the reason why that's important is because it speaks to an amateur player. It speaks to the casual player. Most of us have phones. A lot of us don't have PCs. A lot of us don't have consoles. So it touches an audience on a wider scale. Also, a lot of a lot of companies are looking into developing mobile games. One, as we see with apps, there's a range of apps, just like there's a range of games, and there's not enough games for the to pretty much touch all the users that are available. So instead of building a console game, which for instance, like a game like Red Dead Redemption, which costs 944.2 million to make, and they make their money back off of selling the game, which is like discounted $40 a piece, a person could probably spend a company specifically can spend about one third of that, probably even less than one third to build out a mobile game and make three times of their money back, even if they sell their game free based off of in-app purchases. Like, so for instance, like Fortnite, which is a huge game, it's a free game, but they made 1.8 billion last year. And all of that is based off of in-app purchases. So mobile games gives more free range to do more things that, to do more things to build out the IP of the game and it's less into production. So it's a very it's an important thing in this atmosphere. So Roger, talk to us about talent and agency agreements. Sure. So um, you know, I think this dovetails also with uh, the discussion earlier about players associations. You know, certainly uh, the easy topic um, or the, the easy yeah the easy topic involving players associations is you know how do we protect players from their teams and their organizations and uh, even the leagues. But there's also the notion of protecting players from the people that are supposed to help the players. Uh, and traditionally, we have seen players associations uh, in traditional sports um, you know, enact some sort of oversight over their player agents as well. Um, which is definitely something that's that's well needed within this space. Um, you know, currently we see that there is a somewhat of a boom in esports player agents. Um, essentially they're individuals, you know, because there's no sort of licensure requirement here outside of any applicable state licensure, uh, we have individuals that are representing players um, who may not necessarily have any sort of credentials um, to negotiate their deals on their behalf, be it with their organization, with sponsors, and the like. Um, obviously that is ripe for potential issues to arise. Um, as far as the agreements with the players themselves go, uh, you tend to see a, a wide range. Um, you know, traditionally uh, professional sports has its sort of three, four, five rule with respect to the percentages that, uh, that athlete agents take, depending on the sport that they play. Uh, in esports, you see everything from about three to I've heard as high as 15%. Um, which, of course, in the context of the uh, some of the high salary numbers that Hal was discussing earlier, can be quite significant, um, despite the fact that they, you know, those salaries aren't necessarily as high as what you would see in traditional sports. Um, on the there is also a a significantly sized um, marketing agent pool right now. Um, you do have a ton of of companies that have developed as esports marketing agents both to professional players as well as content creators. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you're seeing anywhere between 15 to 30% in terms of commission uh, in that route. The interesting issue that that presents as well, because we don't have any sort of regulation over the marketing agents, it, aside from state regulation, is the fact that um, you do have some marketing agents that are double dipping. So they're representing the brand themselves. Brand says, hey, marketing agent, you know, we're going to sign your company. And then, oh, you also are going to find us a bunch of influencers or players. And then marketing company says, hey, I have a bunch of players. We're going to feed this marketing deal now through our players. So then they're taking their cut off of the brand deal and then off of the player deal, um, which is a significant issue, especially when, you know, those, especially when those, those agents over or over 
bite off more than they can chew realistically uh, with respect to the, the size of those portions that they're taking. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's an area that is getting a lot of attention, um, not only amongst the developers, but also amongst um, other oversight bodies uh, or internal oversight bodies um, like the Esports Integrity Commission, um, which has now created its uh, key talent agent subcommittee, uh, which is looking to develop essentially self-governing rules for esports agents. Seems like there are a lot of uh, places throughout this where lawyers are playing a significant role. Roger, you've done some deals with uh, professional, traditional professional athletes investing in esports. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, and then we can bring Hal into that conversation? Sure. So one of the ways that uh, that traditional sports is getting involved is simply in ownership. Um, and that's at every level, player, individual, professional player, um, team ownership, et cetera. And um, what they're doing is, you know, they're essentially, because the, the cost of entry into the esports space to create a brand new organization, and when I say organization, I mean uh, an overarching body, so no different than a professional sports franchise. However, that franchise may operate in a couple different games. Um, so the cost of entry into creating a competitive new esports organization is relatively low compared to what it would be for a traditional sports team. The only caveat to that being some of the franchise leagues, which have eight-figure uh, buy-ins just for the the opportunity to participate in those leagues. But nonetheless, you know, especially on the on the professional athlete side of things, they're looking to be involved in the space that they themselves enjoy because they play a lot of video games and um you know to them it's 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 you know there's an element that's a cool factor there's an element that's you know hey this is something that you know may grow you know quite huge in the next several years and i'm not going to be playing forever so let's see where this goes uh and simply just diversification um but nonetheless there is a, a significant interest by uh traditional sports into esports Hal, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, everything Roger said is, is spot on. The, um, you know, the interesting thing, even with eight-figure franchise fees, you know, those are still a fraction of what it costs to buy a traditional sports league, a uh, sports team. So, you know, you see NBA teams are basically all valued at north of a billion dollars. NFL teams are, you know, north of two billion. Um, MLB, you know, same range. Um, so, you know, the, the opportunity to be a professional sports owner for 10, 20, 30 million dollars um, in a sport that you know, in a space that is continuing to grow it at hockey stick levels is, uh, you know, is a very compelling opportunity for um, professional sports owners and, and other sports as well as other wealthy individuals. Uh, I think one of the reasons that you see a lot of professional sports owners and or their teams um, investing in esports is the opportunity to expand their branding. So you, you have not just talking about like the league level, like an NBA 2K, which is a NBA and and Take Two combination um, league. Uh, you also see a lot of individual sports owners um, through their teams um, buying uh, properties in esports. So and and as I said, you know it's a brand extension play. It's an opportunity to um, reach new fans. And um, you know, it's also an investment opportunity, and um, I think we'll continue to see that grow. It's also very interesting and um, compelling for the leagues because they're bringing in. Historically, the teams were often started by former gamers or other people in the space who just you know had had some money, had some wherewithal, and put a team together. Um, as they've as as the leagues have grown and they've become more profitable, and and the opportunities for growth are are more significant than I think most people initially thought. Um, the leagues are looking for people who have expertise in sports marketing and um, fan engagement, and we're we're better to find that than you know NBA, NFL, MLB franchises where um, you know, they've been doing this for decades. So in in League of Legends, there are four teams, actually five, that are um, that share NBA ownership. Um, you know, Overwatch has many owners from football and, and uh, NFL, NBA involved and in, in, uh, other leagues, you're seeing the same thing. So uh, this is an interesting um, 
development over the last few years, and I think will something that we'll continue to see as uh, the leagues continue to franchise and grow. Tara, talk to us about eSport activation at entertainment events and how that has been impacted by what we're all unfortunately going through now with COVID-19. Well, before um, COVID, um, pretty much festival organizers that organize, organizers as well as like tournament um, throwers for eSports, we're starting to see that there was a cross pollinization of like of artists and esports players to where it was like, it's a big new form of entertainment, how we can mix it all together. So for instance, if you look at tournaments, it's thrown like a festival. Even though you have kids playing in, um, playing on the stage, it's widespread, sold out like a festival. The production is just like a festival. They have DJ music playing in. So there was lots of talks and ways to just bind them in together. So a lot of, a lot of festivals saw that even like when you go to these different festivals and you see that there's a, a, double, a number of acts going on and people are trying to find different things to do during these different acts. They wanted to bring gaming activations to just bring a whole different audience and to bring just more diversity to their festivals. Usually where before they would have gaming lounges for the artists to play behind the scenes while they're waiting for the set, they thought to bring it out. So it gives attendees to go and do something to do so now because of covid they're trying to figure out different ways of how it could be you can still kind of create that same experience but just stream it like we said streaming and content creation is a huge thing so they're trying to find ways it's where you could have artists be somewhere over there esports players be in different rooms but still have that interaction that we wanted to create at festivals so piggyback on that, there's um, one interesting development that we've seen, particularly come through Fortnite, is the absolute inverse, where they're taking their game and they have their game as a platform, and they want to bring that festival atmosphere into the game. Mm -hmm. And one way that they've done that is they've actually had live performances and concerts in game. So the first event that they did was with an EDM DJ by the name of Marshmallow. Um, you could during they announced at a specific time there was going to be a game mode that was available. You could join that game mode, and it's a giant concert. You can run around, watch the festivities. Um, it was you know no one was playing the game; they were just in the game to watch the concert. And then the game developer monetized that by selling all sorts of in-app in-game purchases that you know leveraged the IP of the performer as well as the game itself. That way, after the event ended, you could still walk around, you know, let's say dressed as the, the artist that you saw. Um, so it becomes a little uh, badge of honor in that way, and also a creative way that you can implement and merge the two entertainment properties. Wow, that's so interesting. I'm learning so much. So it wouldn't be life, and it certainly wouldn't be sports if there weren't issues and controversies involved. So Tara, obviously I have to ask you about the first issue. Esports has quite the reputation for sexism and not embracing women. Is that true or not true in your experience or in what you've observed? Um, I would say that it is true. You do have people that are welcoming, but yes. I mean, esports is seen as a very male dominated industry even when you look at investors you look at people high in organizations you see mostly males so i've experienced on the professional side that's like the same thing most women would experience their days of another walks of business the same thing of maybe not taking you seriously maybe not thinking you understand what's happening or not even understanding your role in the room so on a professional side but then on a gamer side because my company does represent a couple of gamers who happen to be really good in in a in a game that you would traditionally think that is played just by boys so they they experience a lot of backlash on instagram their twitter so we represent chiquita chiquita is an amazing 2k player she's also good at call of duty as well those are two traditional esports where you would think mostly guys are better at she entered the combine did well and was able to enter into the draft for the 2K League and ended up being the first woman to be drafted into the 2K League. And though everything is based off of skill and there's really no way to cheat your way 
into the combine or to be drafted, that's a lot of the flack she received that a lot of people thought she cheated or she just did something crazy to get into it. it told her to go back into the kitchen, racial things. So it was, it was crazy even to see, even though she made it there and there was, there was an obvious no way to cheat and it was based off of her skill that she still received all this flack for it. So that's interesting. So Roger or Hal, do you want to address that or what? Roger, you've been in this a long time. What have you seen and observed? So sexism is definitely a significant issue um, at all levels. You know, for streamers, for players, you know, it's really no different. On the on the player side of things, you definitely see uh, what Tara just mentioned in terms of uh, female players not getting essentially credit for their ability. Um, we even had an issue this past week where there was a female Overwatch player who, along with five of her male teammates, won a won a uh, online tournament, and then immediately after the, you know they won the tournament. Uh, she's getting messages all over her various social media feeds that, you know, it's really the other five guys that carried her or her skill was, uh, you know, completely irrelevant to the victory, despite the fact that she's extremely talented. Um, so it's it definitely is a, is a significant issue on that front. On the content creator side of things, uh, one of the most um, unfortunately frequent issues that you hear about it are uh, streamers who are told that the only reason why they have a following is because they're attractive and mm -hmm. or rather that they should be they should dress more provocatively or things of that sort um and that'll flood you know any of their chats while they're playing and engaging with the community and then they have to constantly play catch up in terms of all right let's get these people banned from my room uh, my chat room that way uh that way i can you know proceed and do what i do in, in entertaining um so you know, it's still definitely an issue. It's still something that, you know, we do need to be, make more strides towards, uh, towards rectifying. And it's something that, you know, really all participants, you know, in the industry need to be more mindful of and be and ensure much more inclusivity. So esports mirrors the rest of life. So here's another issue. 18-year-olds um, and teenagers making millions of dollars as esports players. And uh, how, how, how is the whole issue of child players and minors getting caught up in this uh, being handled in the industry? Roger, do you want to start? And then Hal can jump in. Sure. Um, I mean, realistically, you have players uh, depending on the structure of the of the league or the tournament itself the leagues generally uh deter set a minimum age of participation um that age tends to be 16 or 17 depending on the games being played tournament structures can go a little younger uh you have had events that allowed players as young as 13 to participate um it's something that you know certainly the organizations are mindful of from a contract perspective uh, because there are obviously the many steps that we need to take to ensure that a contract is legally appropriate with a minor. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of issues that, there's a lot of potential issues that arise um, considering that, yet the organizations, is, depending on the game and depending on the, the level of sophistication of the, the individuals involved, which varies widely, um, you do see a lack of that sort of contractual knowledge um, to say that, you know, oh, it's OK if I just sign this 15 year old to an esports contract because they signed a contract. So that has to be legally binding. Right. Um, it's something that, you know, def there definitely needs to be more education on, you know, regardless of, of whoever takes up that uh, that torch. Um, I mean, certainly the easiest thing, in my opinion, would be for the developers to say, you know, these are our minimum ages. We're not going to go below these. These are, you know, the standards that we have to put in place. How can the, some of the techniques and laws used in traditional sports to deal with minors, uh, shouldn't those apply to the esports realm? Yeah, I mean, I think they generally do with regard to league play. Uh, as Roger said, most of the leagues have minimum ages, and it's typically 17 or 18. League of Legends, um, you have to be a high school graduate to play. Um, you know, part of the problem is the international nature of, of esports. Um, you know, different countries have different rules. So, um, 
And, you know, there's also the aspect that, you know, many of these players are, are teenagers. And, and as we saw with Fortnite last year, um, this past year, a 13 year old won the $3 million prize. So clearly um, age is not necessarily an impediment to, to skill and to success. Um, so I think, you know, on the league level, you know, it's a, it's a very um, developed issue and, you know, there are hard limits as to the age you have to be to, to, to participate, but tournaments are, are different. And um, for a lot of reasons, you know, they're, they're held all around the world and, um, you know, they're in their, their, their structure is much less um, hard, much less uh, established. Um, one real world example to one of the points Roger made with regard to orgs and um, not necessarily being a, a, so attuned to this issue. We had a player who was a high school kid who was signed to a contract by a, 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 a team, a team that used to be in League of Legends. And um, the player wasn't happy with the contract or the team and wanted to try to get out of the contract and, and assisting him, I discovered that he had signed the contract as a minor and they hadn't gotten parental consent on the agreement. So we were able to get him declared a free agent and he was able to leave that team, sign a better contract with another team. So I think, you know, the orgs are, are you know, this is an area where good lawyering is obviously a, a, a good benefit um, and, uh, you know, something that they're, you know, they're working toward. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. a frequent um, occurrence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's let's go to the free speech issue. Um, we want to kind of get through these last couple of issues so that we can get audience questions. But um, Hal, you raised the issue of free speech being um, an issue with respect to the blizzard uh, issue that was reported in the press recently. Do you want to chat about that briefly? Sure. Um, so there were just two very similar circumstances that arose in a very um, concurrent period of time. Uh, there was a player, Blitz Chung, who played um, Hearthstone. Um, he's uh, um, he su tweeted support of the protesters in Hong Kong um, and um, was immediately excoriated by the Chinese government. Um, Blizzard um, banned him from the game, and um, you know he was a subject of a lot of both vitriol um, by some people and support by others. Uh, eventually, um, Blizzard backtracked and, and reduced his suspension um, or reduced his banishment to a, a short suspension and he was allowed to um, eventually resume play. But it was a very interesting circumstance when contrasted with what happened on the NBA side when Daryl Morey, the president of basketball operations for the Houston Rockets, also tweeted support for the Chinese protesters, for the Hong Kong protesters. Um, and uh, while the NBA took a lot of heat for that and the Houston Rockets lost millions and millions of dollars of sponsorship from uh, their Chinese sponsors, um, you know, the Rockets had long been a, a darling of the Chinese market because of their association with Yao Ming. So they'd always had a large presence in China and a lot of Chinese sponsors. Um, you know, they were, you know, significantly impacted economically by that. But notwithstanding that, both the team and uh, the NBA stood by Morey, said that he had rights to, to express his opinion, that they weren't the, you know, the both the team and the league said that he was expressing his opinion, not the opinion of the league or the team, but um, they supported his right to do so and, and that they were not gonna punish him, notwithstanding um, the a program, a program they were receiving from, uh, uh, from the Chinese government and their Chinese sponsors. So just two different reactions by two different entities um, very, very, you know, opposite, very polar op reactions. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the things with Blitzchung was um, he was based in Asia. So that was probably part of uh, what happened. But, you know, Blizzard, I think not being, not having the experience and, um, you know, previous, uh, it, it, previous experience with, with conflicts and, and major issues arising like the NBA had just reacted in a very, I think reactive manner um, and you know just trying to appease uh, China. Um, Blizzard is also owned by uh, has a significant ownership interest um, um, by a Chinese company. So I think there was just a lot of different factors that uh, led to the different outcomes. Roger, do you want to touch a little bit on labor and employment? I mean, you've mentioned some issues, but are there controversies or what are what are the issues that players and gamers may need lawyers for? Sure. Um, realistically, there's a 
trend, for lack of a better term, in terms of uh, categorizing esports players as independent contractors. And um, that's promulgated effectively by the organizations. And in some circumstances, it's, for lack of a better term, encouraged by the leagues um, in not putting forward any sort of uh, right, any sort of self-contained regulations there. Uh, so what's happened is you have that you create a wide disparity uh, in terms of player rights. You have some leagues like uh, League of Legends and Overwatch where you're effectively required to have an employment agreement and you are an employee, you have salary, you have benefits and get the whole host of rights that um, state and federal employment law would afford to you. Uh, you have other leagues which are much more freeform or even more tournament based where um, the tournament or not the tournament organizers where the organizations themselves will be looking to you know minimize cost as much as possible they're looking to uh, categorize their team and their players as contractors so that they don't have to worry about the added costs of uh, tax withholding or uh, providing benefits and the like. So this has been a big source of contention um, throughout my entire history in esports. Um, it's something that is starting to trend towards employment. However, um, you know, given the disparate nature in terms of what constitutes an, an independent contractor, even just across the United States, uh, not only even dealing with the international issues, um, it's something that you see a lot of you know, forum shopping, for lack of a better term, and you know, for gov for governing law, uh, just to to continue to try and avail themselves of that that contractor status. And it's something so, that I'm sure will be challenged in time. It's just a, yeah. it's a matter of time before that happens, um, right. and and that may even be one of those watershed moments, as like we discussed earlier, which pushes towards a players association. One interesting so the, thing, if so I could I'm add. Gonna touch on this whole issue of how traditional athletes uh, seem to be um, not embracing esport players and gamers as athletes. And Tara, uh, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure, I think um, so. I think it's a bit different now during this COVID section because everybody is playing esports. So it's a bit different. So I think prior to this, um, it's just a, there was a misconception of what esports was. Like what they discussed before, it's it's competitive gaming, and people just think of it as just someone in their basement eating pizza, being very antisocial. There's no real idea into the real skill and training that goes into it. Like a professional player. Now, this an amateur player. I can't speak so much to what they do, but I know for professional players, they, it's like a regular athlete, you have to eat right, you have to sleep right, you have to exercise, you have to be well kept because you have to keep your mind on a certain level to be able to play these games. Not only is it just playing, you are training. There's a lot of times they, they spend on hand-eye coordination, like how so they could practice from 12 to 18 hours a day. Some of them have trainers, a lot of them have nutritionists, like they go to the gym, they make sure they eat right. So it's like, because a lot of them are in one household, it's able to be contained. So because there's there's a stereotype idea of what an esports player is is the reason why some athletes kind of get misunderstand of what it is that they do as well as because it's not the there's no physical aspect to what they're doing they don't think of it as it being a sport or them being an athlete but besides the physical aspect it's just the same Right, and I've experienced that working uh, a lot on the Olympic sports side when I try to engage with traditional athlete, Olympic athletes on the issue of esports, they they almost don't even want to have the conversation. They're very contemptuous uh, as a as a broad <laughs> generalization. So what you're seeing is a big disconnect between the, the people who run and govern Olympic sports wanting esports in and a large percentage of the athletes who are in the traditional olympic sports who are very much against it so so we want to uh, reserve a good amount of time for questions so these next few slides are just making the obvious point that you all have made throughout your presentation is that there are no shortage of legal issues uh, and um, business issues 
involved in esports that require lawyers. Uh, it seems to me that lawyers need to be involved in every aspect um, of what is going on and have been. And uh, obviously, this is a presentation for uh, lawyers. And um, as has been mentioned earlier, the coronavirus has even opened this world of esports up so much more because now that everyone has to stay home or is encouraged to stay home even if they aren't, um, the traditional sports who used to eschew the players of whom I was just saying are really against esports, their organizations are creating all these esport type games, as is reflected on this slide, in the advent of the coronavirus. So you, you have this, uh, this bringing together uh, that has been caused by uh, this global pandemic. And as always, uh, there are opportunities for lawyers. So um, Hal, I don't know if you want to just take this slide and talk about, just pick a few and, and talk about opportunities for lawyers here. Sure, let me uh, just pull the slide up. Um, mine's not advancing, but. Oh, okay, well, I can read it to you. Intellectual property, contract deal attorneys, corporate transactional finance and tax attorneys. I mean, you're, you're the primary example of a deal attorney and a sports and entertainment attorney and agent who is involved in this, right? Sure. Yeah, I like to think so. Yeah, I mean, the you know, the, look, it's it's like any space. Um, you know, there's there's a opportunity for almost any kind of lawyer in the space, and because it's such a new space, because it's such a new industry, um, you know, a lot of it is still being discovered, and um, you know, there, uh, you know, it, it grows on a daily basis. Uh, you know, IP is certainly one of the the more um, important areas in the space because. Um, you know, everything that these companies are doing uh, touches on either patent law, trademark law, copyright law. Um, you know, they're, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're cases that arise every day um, in these areas. Um, I was just reading about um, a, a recent case, a, a copyright case um, that had to do, it was a, it was a combination of um, the NBA and esports in one, where uh, it was an NBA 2K game, um, and the the um, the tattoos of the players uh, were were incorporated into their um, their images in the game in the NBA 2K game, and the 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 Got copyright it. holder of the of the tattoos um, brought a lawsuit saying that um, you know they were their copyrights were being elite were being infringed. Um, the case was uh, decided against the, the tattoo rights holder um, for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, those are just I'm sure nobody thought when when NBA 2K and um, was putting their game together, I'm sure they didn't even think that that was an issue. But had they had a, an IP attorney um, on staff, maybe that was something that would have been flagged. Um, could have saved everyone a, a fair amount of uh, litigation expense. Um, you know, as as uh, uh, Roger spoke. You know, there's a huge need for deal attorneys, um, contract attorneys. Uh, you know, a lot of these contracts are badly drafted. Um, you know, they 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 don't anticipate uh, a lot of issues that are that are going to arise. And um, uh, you know, just a lot of this is just people are in the space without um, without a lot of um, knowledge and experience. And so, just they're just bad. I, I see bad contracts every day. I'm sure Roger's seen. Um, you know, seen hundreds, if not thousands, in the course of his dealings. Um, transactional work, uh, there's a lot of that available. Finance and tax attorneys, their tax issues are rising every day. Uh, their their new, um, you know, states, uh, th there's have always been, um, for the last 15 years or so, states have gone after professional athletes who play games or, or competitions in, their, in, a, in a particular jurisdiction. Um, seeking a percentage of the revenue from their contracts or their earnings based on their participation in the state that's starting to filter into esports now as people realize how much money is uh, is 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 flowing through esports um, so having tax attorneys on both the player and the team side uh, is is uh, is key um, Roger certainly talked about this and I can't agree more having qualified uh, attorneys 
um, act as agents and, and uh, entertainment lawyers for the streamers and casters uh, is, is critical. They're, um, the people that have been in the space historically um, just had some relationship, but the gamers didn't necessarily have any um, real world experience negotiating contracts, representing athletes, uh, representing entertainers, and um, you know just the deals have, have historically been um, really lacking. So uh, you know, getting yeah. people who understand the industry, who understand um, sports, who understand um, deals is uh, is critical for the advancement of uh, of player rights. I want to bring Tara in here and have you just. Uh, we're going to go right after this to the uh, participant questions, and I, I think you can type in your questions, uh, but we'll clarify that. So, Tara, I think this would be you're an in house attorney and business person. I thought it would be really interesting for the audience to just hear very briefly about about your transition from being just a lawyer outside of esports to how you became in house business and legal affairs COO kind of person, if you don't mind telling that story briefly. Um, sure. So um, pretty much I was, I had a meeting with our founder and I was, I was just literally getting into being an entertainment and sports attorney. That was my main interest. Um, I'm probably the youngest and less experienced on the panel. So that was what I wanted to do. And I met with him because it was an entertainment company he was at. And when I got there, we were just, he was just giving me pointers because he's been in the industry for a while. And he started telling me about esports. And I, just like most people, you heard about it, but you just think like, oh, those are kids that play video games. Like, what's special about that? And he was explaining to me like how the industry is going to start booming, the idea he has for his company to kind of touch all the ancillary business parts as well as the tournaments. And just was telling me about it's a, it's a, startup company and just telling different things that it's a pushing um the minority audience and that it's a it's a minority owned company and just told me about it and i was really interested in it and i was like okay i do entertainment law and this is a different form of entertainment and essentially a different form of sports as well so i was like okay let me look into this so i was, asked him if I could um, intern there for a little bit, like on a couple of days, just to get more experience on the job. And then when I was working with them, just like how touched on, because there is a startup and they don't really, they didn't have an attorney on there. There were so many things happening that they didn't look at that. Okay. I was like, oh, you should have this. You should have an NDA when you're talking to people. You should, you know, structure the deal like this. So I was just giving pointers that because there wasn't anybody there that they didn't think of. And from that, they brought me, he asked me to be a part of their team and I pretty much became in-house counsel. And then from that, because I was really dealing with the deals and understanding the operations of the different projects we're working on, they pushed me to be COO. So that, that's amazing. And, and congratulations to you on that. Um, the, our panel could go on and talk forever on many of these mm -hmm. issues. And if, if there is that interest, we can, uh, we intend to uh, put on future editions of this with a more specific focus. But at this point, we're interested in hearing what your questions are for the panel. Uh, Loic, are folks typing in questions? How do you want to handle this? Sure, we have one question. It states, do teams and players need to obtain licenses from the game developers to market themselves in connection with their specific teams? Or do those get passed through the leagues and tournament organizers? Who wants to take that question? So, I, go ahead, Roger. I was going to say, generally speaking, um, in terms of marketing themselves, there's some hefty terms of use involved um, mm -hmm. that, that really focuses on what you can utilize as far as the game's branding. Um, so, that unto itself would confer the license. However, the if a team were to want to participate in a professional league, they would have to go about the, or, or also a player, they would have to go about whatever the respective means of qualifying is. So in some games that may be essentially just climbing the ladder and then winning a tournament and then getting entry into a league. For others, as Hal mentioned previously, that may be you know, we need to pay a franchise fee. Once we hit, once we pay the franchise fee, are accepted into the league, then we can officially say we are a part of this league. Um, 
a, a quick note on the franchise side of things. In order for a team to actually join and be a part of a league, there also tends to be a hefty, uh, whether it be a franchise agreement or a team participation agreement that's involved, that's essentially a contract between whatever the league entity is and the, um, and the organization or the player. Um, sometimes, depending on the league, there may be contracts directly between the league and the player, and then separately between the league and the team. Um, here you see a lot of co-branding language. Um, that's where you're going to find all of your language about you know, what rights you have to utilize certain branding, what rights you have, what rights the league has in order to create certain content, utilize likeness, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so esports unto itself is a giant licensing mechanism on, in, in a way. Um, it, it, rather, the industry entirely operates off of the exchange of likenesses, uh, the exchange of licenses in one form or another. Did you want to add to that, Hal? No, that was <laughs> that covered it. <laughs> All right, we have another question. Uh, as a solo practitioner interested in embarking into the esports player or team attorney, where is the best place to start to build a book of business? I'm sorry, is the question somebody wants to be a, a team attorney or a player attorney? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess we can handle it from both sides. So, um, you know, if you want to represent players, um, I mean, obviously, like in, in, in any sport, it, it's all about access. So, you know, whether it's attending tournaments, going to league matches, um, you know, following people on Twitter and, and DMing, you know, DMing them, um, you know, you just have to create a path to um, to having a relationship with people that you want to represent. Um, and, you know, it's not it's not the easiest thing to do. It requires a lot of work and a lot of effort. But, um, you know, that's that's going to be the path. There's no unlike for traditional sports where. You know, you, you kind of know in baseball and football who draftees are and you can, you know, directly sort of go after them. There's no direct path. Um, you know, there's no um, there's no, um, you know, an informal method where people are are become pros. So it, it just like they they climb the ladder. They get picked up by a team and and they're a pro so it's not you know you can't just go identify the top 100 people in a sport mm -hmm. and and sort of go after them it's not that it's not that um evolved at this point so it's really sort of just finding out who the active players are um reaching out to them directly and um and and pursuing uh you know trying to convince them that you're the person that is is uh the best person to represent them um, on the team you side. Done this. Roger, you've done this. So what, what is yeah. your. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so realistically, I, I think how spot on um, the one thing I would add to that is know your game and know that mm -hmm. game's business community. You know, you, you need, even if you're not necessarily a player yourself, you need to be speaking the same language. Um, it's, I found that it is, incredibly difficult to try and you know represent a business or you know, any client even if it's an individual's interest without understanding in depth what all of the moving parts are you know with respect to the deal um, and that means knowing you know some of the the business of esports itself mm -hmm. so I would say learn as much as you can um, you know, in terms of reading up on, you know, there's various esports business resources now, like Esports Observer, Esports Insider. Those are both websites um, with great content. Sports Business Journal also has some uh, content that's put out through Esports Observer now. Um, learn about all of the back end of the of the space. That way, when you do have your first client or your first several clients, you can really do. Uh, holistic work for them on any given transaction. Yeah. Tara, did you want to, I mean, Tara just told her story. Did uh, did you do any prep to learn about the esports industry? Well, yeah. I mean, the good thing about it is that I was learning on the job, but yeah, I did. I had to do a lot of research because they did have a couple of people signed before I joined, but um, research about the different games there's a lot of different games and i had to make sure i speak the language 
to so it's off awesome. gamers can but understand when you're just trying out. to be about business. They could I think we lost your we're losing your connection. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. So what was the last part of what you said? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, I was saying that also, like learning the business is that like gamers can read through the crap they understand yeah. when you're not authentic they understand when you just want want business so it is very important to speak the language as well as know the game and it's also very important to understand the skill set and what it is that you're trying to do for them as well so that like i would definitely say a big thing is not only learning um learning about it but as well as becoming comfortable with the industry so watching watching different streams, going to different tournaments, just be able to pinpoint what makes this person a really good player over this person. Because sometimes off of branding, it's not necessarily winning tournaments, it's the personality that's something. So it's just being able to pinpoint the differences in the, the value of a player. Any other questions, Lewick? Yep, uh, another question. Are colleges or universities involved in esports um, or owners of um, intellectual property, institutional investors involved, et cetera? Uh, well, we, we, had, we addressed the, the college and, and high school one earlier. Yes, uh, there are a growing number of college and high school programs around the country that uh, are fielding esports teams and with various uh, titles. Um, you know, that's something that it grows on literally a daily basis. Um, with regard to institutional investors, um, there is some of that, but for the most part, uh, the leagues are focusing on um, small groups or individuals to, um, with regard to owning teams in, in the franchise leagues. So there, in the past, we did have some VC get involved on the team side, and we still do have it a little bit, but it's much more of the, the private investors and small groups, as Hal mentioned. Um, realistically, the biggest issue that VC were tending to find was the fact that there wasn't this same sort of defined uh, cash out period. Uh, that they were looking for. You know, most VC want to be able to exit in five years and have a, you know, specific multiplier hit. You know, because, you know, esports it, it being still, you know, largely new, um, you know, we're not in a mature enough place where a lot of these, where a lot of esports organizations are, you know, even financially healthy. Um, but certainly not in a place where in five years, you're just going to sell off a chunk of equity and then, you know, hope that that has a, a you know, that 5x or 10x multiplier that the VC is looking to hit. So we're, we haven't created a, we, there is no um, cookie cutter business model for an esports organization that then can track that level of accepted growth that VC are looking for. So it's still there. Uh, however, it's in just much, much uh, smaller frequency. And I think generally the developers aren't looking for VC money on the team side just because they want, you know, they, they want to have a, a small group of owners that they're dealing directly with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Lewick? Just got one more that just came in. Um, being that sports leagues are international, which law governs in the event of a dispute, i.e. with the First Amendment issue, how mentioned Chinese citizenship as a factor? Everybody? And I don't think there's a clean answer there. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to say, I think it depends the parties involved and what's usually in those contracts dealings of what laws governing it. It's not, yeah, it's not clear cut. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you hit the, the nail on the head in the sense that there are issues, you know, esports inherently dealing internationally raises choice of law issues. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have clean answers for that yet. Um, that's something that, you know, we're still, we still have our learning curve as an industry to really adapt to. Um, there have been several instances, particularly of team to team issues, uh, that raised very significant choice of law questions, particularly around whether, whether a, a letter of intent was binding or not, um, which almost came to litigation. However, it's something that, you know, largely is just going to get dealt with, um, you know, amicably thus far. 
Well, you raise a good point that we discussed in our preparation for this panel and we haven't yet discussed. So let's jump into it because we've been given this opportunity. I raised the issue when we were planning about the use of dispute resolution clauses and contracts. And uh, Roger quickly said, yeah, they're always in the first draft, but they never survive. So then I asked, well, then how disputes get, get resolved? And you all said, well, we just negotiate it out. So, so talk to this audience about that aspect of it, if you want to start, Roger. Sure. So arbitration clauses are pretty standard. Uh, the issue is they never get used. Um, the biggest reason why is largely because one, more often than not, the cost involved becomes somewhat prohibitive, especially depending on what the potential gain is, or res with respect to what the potential gain is. And um, you know, secondary to that, we also have the issue of the fact that esports being very, very concerned with its public image and public reputation, uh, both the individual players as well as the organizations. So there's, you know, there at times there's concern that if an individual is uh, sticking up for their rights, that they may have every legal right to do so. That if that is perceived poorly, whether by other or by other, you know, entities within the the business or even by the fans, that that may be significant enough justification for them to not take any legal action. Yeah, I'd say that Reddit is the biggest arbitrator of disputes in in the <laughs> esports space at this point. Definitely. So, are you saying that esports is more <laughs> with its image than any other company? I mean, aren't all companies concerned with their image and their brand? Yeah, I, certainly, but I think in esports, you know, the fan base is, is so strident and so involved mm -hmm. and such a, a key component of the whole industry that um, it really does drive a lot of, uh, a lot of thinking and a lot of, um, a, a lot of decision making. I think it's, it's the hyper-connected nature that Hal spoke to previously about how close and how much connection there is between the fans and the teams and the players themselves, that it's a double-edged sword, right? Like you want that level of engagement because then you can build very close connections and you can then market to those connections and grow the revenue that way. However, if that close connection then turns on you because they feel that you are not doing something appropriate for one reason or another, then you, the opposite effect happens. And then you draw the ire. Uh, well, no one likes to have someone so close to them be quite angry with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's really just the same sort of circumstance there. Lewick, do you have anything else? Yep, got another question. Um says is receiver donations considered gambling is it betting uh, receiver donations as in is it like what do you mean i'm at are, oh there's only one question is he referring to like when you do streams or content videos and you get donations from people watching is that what he's referring to i am not i mean or, the short the short answer is it's not gambling yeah why because uh, you're not you're you're, you're making it if, if i think i understand the question you're making a donation to to a streamer yeah. it's not there's no there's no wagering there's no there's no game of chance um you know it's just it's a straight it's a straight donation it's you, you know, don't it's like, have to do it to actually watch them it's just it's based right. off of how you feel so so as a non-gamer, can you explain this to me? So you have gamers that are, are online, they're streaming, and they're asking people who are watching them to give them money? They're not really asking. It just, um, I mean, it, it's not like a, it's not a, it, it's more of a implicit um, mm -hmm. request. It's just something that happens. It, it's how it does, it's how it developed. It's not, you know, it's not like, hey, donate, you know, I, I need you to donate $5. There are different, there's subscription streaming, where you pay for a certain right, um, or you, you you pay to want, follow a streamer and you get certain benefits associated with that. And then you can also just watch a streamer and make a donation. It's seen as supporting your favorite content creators. It's helping them do what they do. If you enjoy watching them, it's a way of essentially crowdfunding their salary. So it's like when you go to a jazz bar and there's a glass on the piano and you yeah. go up and you put a donation in the glass. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 
Oh, that's that's fascinating. Um, Lewick, do you have any more questions? We got time for one more question. Um, this is a long one. It says, is it, is it rare that a particular games that are successful or popular for a long period of time? So in the instance of, let's just say, a Fortnite that is extremely popular now, how does the industry, players, investors, et cetera, prepare an exit strategy for when the game's popularity starts to decline? Uh, Go ahead, Tara. No, I'm trying to understand. The, can you read the question? I know it was so long. Can you read the question again? Well, let me summarize. It sounds yeah. like what they're saying is that certain games become popular, right? And mm -hmm. then well, the question is, do the developers or the owners of the games who promote these different games have a, have a strategy for when that particular game is not a popular hot game anymore and people move on to a different game? Is, is that essentially the question, Loic? Correct. Right. Um, I think it depends on games because you have games that have been out for a while that are in like there. I don't even know what version they're in. So it's like you just continue kind of and essentially riding that wave and just building better updates and still coming out with a new version of the game. So like it's for instance, like 2K and Madden and all of them, they've been out for the longest time and there's just uh, just recent updates and new versions of it. Yeah, I mean, I think developers focus on changing the meta, um, you know, changing the, the 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 game, keeping it fresh, keeping it interesting, yeah. adding new characters, changing the 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 the, the gameplay area, um, you know, changing the format, um, you know, technology, technological advancements. Uh, I think can help keep games interesting. Um, you know, I think that the concern that everybody in the space has is, um, you know. Like while technology is is a boon in a lot of instances, it's also you know potential game ender because you know at some point there's going to be some game changing technology that um, makes you know tr the gameplay as we know it now obsolete. Um, so you know I, I think that um, you know companies try to stay ahead of the curve. They try to um, use technology as as best they can to keep their games fresh and interesting. But um, there are definitely cycles. And, and the team and player perspective, they're very cognizant of how, where in the life cycle, or they try to be very cognizant of where they think a particular game is in the in the life cycle of that game. Um, because certainly an organization doesn't wanna be so tied to a single title that if that title now goes under, well, now they have no, they no longer feel the team and now they have to figure out, you know, how they're gonna keep the organization going. Uh, so you see, you know, as games start to enter the perceived decline by any given organization, um, you see players and teams start to looking to diversify or start looking to what other games their skills um, can lend themselves to. Uh, so that's particularly happening around uh, some titles right now that were pretty significant um, in terms of players looking to uh, looking to see if they have a potential future in a very new game uh, that is, you know, just been released in beta. Uh, but the, you know, eSports is very cognizant of the fact that it is not something that, that each game is not something that lasts forever. You know, despite the fact that we have had games that have been around significant periods of time, you know, they're gonna be genres that even come in and completely upend the entire industry. You know, Battle Royale wasn't even a thing until two, three years ago. And then that took a significant, you know, Fortnite took a significant chunk out of uh, viewership from other games for a period of time. Um, so, you know, there, there will always be those cycles and the, the people, I mean, the, the players and teams especially, uh, whose really their income is very closely tied to uh, the, the popularity and, and the riding that wave uh, of, of an individual okay. game are always going to be very cognizant of, of exit if need be. I'd like to jump in here and say that on behalf of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association and the Diversity Committee of the Entertainment, Arts and Sports Law section of the New York State Bar, we would like to thank this awesome panel that has been so informative in educating the participants about esports. Thank you, Hal Viegas, 
thank you, Tara Inahoro, and thank you, Roger Quiles, for your incredible knowledge and uh, sharing it with the participants uh, who have uh, really benefited tremendously from participating in this program. Uh, I want to remind the participants that the, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association will have has recorded this program and it will be available on the Metropolitan Black Bar Association's YouTube channel, uh, which you can access through its website. And we thank you so much for registering for and participating in this program. And thank you so much for the, to the panel for your insightful, knowledgeable, and professional information that you've imparted to everyone today, this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank Take you, care. Jill. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> thank you.